Yeah, so one thing that we 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 found actually in rodents that I think was really interesting. So there's a lot of people, you know, talk about psychedelic microdosing and the potential for for this or lack thereof. Um, something about microdosing that concerns me is the constant stimulation. You're stimulating the brain every couple of days. Mm. And when we, so we did two studies in a rodent, uh, with dimethyltryptamine, a very rapidly acting, quickly eliminated, uh, psychedelic drug. <clears throat> and if you give one single high dose of dimethyltryptamine, you get robust cortical neuron growth. Uh, if you give a low dose of DMT every three days for, you know, a couple of months, you actually see the opposite. You see cortical neuron retraction. Hmm. And we really think that's because you're overstimulating these cells and you're getting this homeostatic plasticity. The cells are intentionally, you know, culling these, synap these synapses in, in, in dendritic spines so that they don't get overexcited and die. Interesting. So you're giving a sub hallucinogenic dose when you do that? Correct. But the, the dose is still sufficient to turn on the pathway. I see. Interesting. So, so in this microdosing experiment, you get the opposite outcome. You get a retraction in the neurons when you're giving things day by day by day. So in my opinion, I think that um, psychedelic medicine is probably going to be more effective with a single high dose uh, of the compounds rather than a whole bunch of you know small doses. Interesting. Well, that's actually good news in some ways, right? So to the extent that that type of treatment is good, at least for some people, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's obviously, uh, less unscalable if you need one mega dose rather than, you know, a number of them. 100%. And in the case of, of, um, using the traditional hallucinogenic psychedelics, like I mentioned, they do hit the five HT two B receptor. And if you're just agonizing the two B receptor once, probably not that big a deal, but if you're microdosing and you're taking a drug every day for, or every couple of days, every third day for weeks, then you really got to worry about problems in the heart. Interesting. So that'll be something to watch out for because that is something that I think is happening more and more. You're seeing a lot of products in the what you would probably call the gray market, depending on where you're at in the country, where you know people are meant to eat one or two gummies of something containing psilocybin or LSD every day. Yeah, I think that you know counterintuitively, uh, microdosing might be more dangerous than a single high administration of the of the compounds. Interesting. I've never actually heard that articulated before. Um, so. In the time we have left, um, why don't we why don't we discuss uh, uh, something a little bit different? Um, are there any other you know? So who, who are the other labs that are doing interesting work that you're following that people might go check out that are doing things in the general area that you're doing, but but not quite the same stuff? So um, you know, I'll say that I think that the field is growing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when <clears throat> when I started my academic career. There are very few labs looking at like the basic mechanisms of psychedelics. And fortunately, that is starting to change. Uh, there are a lot more groups doing this now. And so um, I, I'll name a few. I'll try to go from west to east so I, if I can make sure I don't forget anybody. Uh, one of the first persons that comes to mind is Boris Heifetz. Uh, I'm actually collaborating with Boris. Uh, Boris has done a lot of work on you know, the effects of MDMA, the mechanisms of MDMA, and uh, very interested in kind of brain mapping. Um, and, you know, Boris and I have a couple of really interesting collaborations going on now. So hopefully something will come of that soon. Um, down in Santa Cruz, uh, Yi Zuo is uh, one of my good friends, and Yi has been on several of the papers with us. She's an expert in two-photon microscopy, uh, in vivo imaging, and so uh, I'm very happy to say that she just got her Schedule One license, and so now she can start doing some more studies on psychedelics. So you can expect that coming out from her uh, more. Uh, in San Diego, you know, there's Adam Halberstadt has been doing this for many, many years, particularly behavioral neuropharmacology. You know, looking at the effects of, of different uh, structurally modified psychedelics in things like the head twitch response assay. Let um, me move. Over there's John McCorvey in uh, in Wisconsin who is doing a lot of receptor pharmacology and signaling and trying to understand how these molecules differentially impact you know biochemical pathways. Um, my uh, good collaborator um, Jamie Peters at University of Colorado. Um, she is very interested in trying to understand how psychedelics and related compounds might be anti-addictive uh, medicines. She's doing a lot of really interesting work there. 
Um, let's keep moving over. Uh, of course, uh, Alex Kwan, who was at Yale, uh, who will be moving to Cornell pretty soon, has been doing a lot of two-photon in vivo imaging. Uh, he had a really nice paper on Neuron showing that psilocybin um, promoted dendritic spine growth for a very long period of time, for at least a month. Um, of course, there's, there's Brian Roth, who's doing lots of really great structural biology work to try to understand how psychedelics differentially, um, differentially activate the 5-HT2A receptor and other GPCRs. And I think Brian's group is also trying to develop uh, some of these non-hallucinogenic analogs of psychedelics for, for treating uh, brain disorders. Um, I know I'm forgetting so many other people. Uh, Gould Dolan is doing some really nice stuff at, at Hopkins, who, um, she, you know, she's really interested in the social, pro-social effects of a lot of these compounds. Um, I'm trying to think of mainly the people that are on the kind of preclinical mechanistic side of things. Oh, in terms of, uh, pharmacology. Oh, I almost forgot Javier Gonzalez Misa. Javier was one of the people that really inspired me to get into this field. Uh, he's really studied a lot of the molecular interactions of the 5-HT2A receptor and how there's this differential signaling, you know, this idea of functional selectivity at the 2A receptor you know, was really pioneered in large part by a lot of Javier's work. Uh, there's Chuck Nichols at LSU. Uh, he's doing a lot of great work on inflammatory processes related to psychedelics. Of course, uh, Chuck's dad, Dave Nichols, was, I think, probably my scientific hero. Um, you know, Dave was a medicinal chemist that was really trying to understand how the structure of psychedelics impacts th their function. And if it wasn't for Dave, I wouldn't be here today, I think. Reading his papers as a graduate student really inspired me to, to, to get into this field. Um, and then there's Dalibar Samas at Columbia, who is making a whole bunch of analogs of Ibogaine and another company. Sorry, I don't want to forget anybody. <laughs> so 